Hey there, this is your vodcast for March the 7th, and um, this is your cue, Liz. It is Friday, right, if you're watching this from the lecture hall. And a few things you want to keep in mind, March 11th, uh, Tuesday, your homework number six is due. So remember to catch me online for office hours on WOW courses on Big Blue Button for um, help on that homework assignment. Uh, if, if things are going smoothly, I'm on an airplane right now on my way to Lake Placid, New York. In lab, we're working on the grades, and we want you to know that they should at this point represent your up-to-date midterm scores. So please do notify your TAs if anything seems a little bit amiss with your lab grades, if something's missing and you know you turned it in. This is a great time to touch bases with your TAs and just make sure that all of your scores are appropriately entered. That being said, we are at a wonderful moment to transition from what we were talking about last time, which was replication, into our coverage today of transcription. So, into our coverage today, which is transcription. So recall that in rep replication, we were looking at the riveting process whereby DNA polymerase was very, very rapidly and accurately synthesizing DNA corresponding to the template strand. And we were seeing that, that um, bi-directional and semi-conservative process leading to the duplication of, for example, the chromosome of a bacterial cell. We looked at E. coli. Today, we're gonna turn our attention and look at the process says within, again, situating ourselves largely within prokaryotes, but looking at the process whereby the DNA is converted into RNA code. So this process is termed transcription. So our goal then is to really zoom in and highlight all of the features and special differences about transcription, um, what it does. I want to take a minute to make sure that everybody understands that upon transcription, there are three possible products that are made. Uh, mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. Now, tRNA and rRNA are, do their job in the cell as RNAs. That is, they do not go on to be further translated into a protein product. But what's cool about them is that they both do their job helping mRNA to get converted into protein products. So tRNAs and rRNAs are the workers of translation, and they do their job as RNAs. So let's go ahead and talk about the process by which by which these RNAs are synthesized. And the first thing that we have to do is a lot of lingo. There is a lot of vocabulary that surrounds the process of transcription. So let's situate ourselves first looking at a gene. That is the, um, the region of DNA that is going to get converted into product, whatever that product may be. And we always orient ourselves in the same way when looking at a gene, that is just through to tradition we look at it with the 5' prime to 3' prime strand being the top strand. And by convention, this strand is called the coding strand or the plus strand. And it's always that 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. That is, if you were to look at the end of the DNA, you would see the 5' prime phosphate on this side on the left and the 3' prime hydroxyl on the right. Of course, things are a little bit more complicated when you're looking at a plasmid because it is completely circular. So we'll talk about how, in fact, we can orient ourselves on plasmids too. So notice then that the opposite strand, of course, will be anti-parallel to the coding strand, um, and it is the 3' prime to 5' prime strand. And as you might guess, instead of being called the plus strand, it is called the minus strand. So the top strand, the plus strand, the coding strand, the 5' prime to 3' prime strand, all of these are terms for that top strand. Whereas the bottom gets some of the opposite nomenclature, it is the 3' prime to 5' prime strand, or the negative strand, um, so it, it's the anti-parallel strand to that top strand. So template is also the term given to this bottom strand, and that's because it is this bottom strand that serves as the code to make the RNA. That is, it is the template for the synthesis of the RNA. RNA. I'm going to show you that in just a moment, but first I want to make mention that the gene by definition is always termed the plus one nucleotide. That is, the start site for the gene is always given that plus one term. And then the ending site is the termination sequence. So we'll be seeing that as standard nomenclature no matter what gene you're looking at. So the gene always is, begins at what we designate the plus one. 
So then it means that the nucleotide to the left of that plus one nucleotide is the minus one. There is no zero by convention. And then to the right of that nucleotide is the plus two. So we can talk about all of the nucleotides in a gene. We could talk about the 684th nucleotide based upon the plus one being the start site. So that's a really important set of terms that goes with this. So as I said, the template strand is given its name because it is what serves as the guide to make the RNA. And I think that this is going to be something I'm going to, I'm going to say this like a bazillion times because I want to make sure everybody is really understanding it. But I'm going to actually draw it and I'm going to do a lot of drawing today because I think it'll help you to visualize all that is going on with transcription. So I'm going to make a little drawing down here showing the same thing that we have up here so that I can give you a better fill for what happens as this DNA is converted in RNA. And I promise we're going to do this about 10 more times at least before it's all over because I have a feeling it's the beginning of the hour right now. Everybody's still asleep. I'm going to wake you up a little bit. And then by the end of the hour, hopefully all of this will start to make sense. So we've got our, our coding strand on the top, the red one there. We've got our template strand on the bottom, the blue one there. And what is going to happen is the enzyme that reads the bottom strand is going to make the RNA. And that enzyme is very fittingly called RNA polymerase. Remember how DNA polymerase made new DNA? Well, RNA polymerase makes new RNA. So we're going to see RNA polymerase come on in. Um, and it's actually going to bind at this region that I've shown in blue over here. So we can kind of make ourselves a little blue box knowing that the enzyme that reads the template strand is going to bind at that blue box. So we'll make this enzyme black. And when this enzyme actually binds to the DNA, it actually serves to melt a stretch of that DNA. So I'm going to try to show that, show you that a part of the DNA that the hydrogen bonds between um, the strands are broken apart and we're going to see it melt. So there's going to be this little melted region, this little bubble. And that actually, I know it doesn't sound like a technical term, but that actually is totes a technical term. So we're going to see this bubble called transcription bubble. And the RNA polymerase did it on its own. So remember how we talked about DNA polymerase requiring DNA helicase to unzip genes? Well, RNA polymerase can unzip its own genes, right? It can do it itself. Um, and it's going to head on down and read the DNA. So as this RNA polymerase enzyme reads the DNA, it's going to read the template strand. So I'm going to do a quick time lapse of this showing that after a certain amount of time, and I promise we're going to do this again, you're going to be totes bored by me, with me by the end of the hour, especially because I keep using the word totes. Credit to my skiers. <laughs> they get me in that habit. I once read an article, what some sort of blog post that said people over 30 shouldn't use a breeze. And uh, so I decided then I must not be over 30. Okay, so what we see here is that after time lapse has occurred, now this RNA polymerase enzyme is further down reading the gene, and it's reading this blue strand. So as it reads, it's pairing RNA, and I'm, I'm just going to make the RNA the same color as the coding strand, because the RNA is pairing transiently. It's hydrogen bonding right here temporarily and transiently with the coding strand. So what this means is that the RNA that's getting made by the RNA polymerase enzyme looks exactly like the coding strand, the top strand, only it's RNA, not DNA, right? So all of you will tell me, based on your awesome performance on the first exam, that that means that U's replace T's everywhere there was a T in the coding strand, they become U's in the RNA. And of course, in all cases, it's a ribonucleotide instead of a deoxyribonucleotide. So we recognize that that would be different in the composition. But otherwise, this looks like, and in fact, this is, let me do this in red, this is the phi prime end. 
of the RNA. So very much like the DNA, it looks almost exactly like that coding strand because it paired with the template strand, right? Everywhere there was a G, it paired with a C. Everywhere there was a T, it paired with an A. Everywhere there was an A, it paired with a almost tricked you, a U, right? And that gave rise to the, the RNA. So let's make sure that, again, in, in case this still doesn't make sense, I promise you 10 more times I'm gonna cover it because it's probably like one of the most important things that we cover in microbiology. So the RNA has the same sequence as the coding strand of DNA, except for that U's replace T's. So what that means is that if you're ever given um, the sequence of the coding strand of DNA, it's very simple to write the RNA sequence. You just write use everywhere that you see a T. Awesome. Let's continue on with our vocabulary. So notice that blue box is where I said that the enzyme RNA polymerase binds and begins the process of transcription. It's not actually a big blue box, and it's a sequence of nucleotides called a promoter. This promoter, I was, I was thinking about it, and I've got skiing on the brain, of course, and I was thinking this is a lot like the start line of a race. The promoter is where everything assembles, and say you're a skier getting ready to start your race, you're going to need a lot of things to help you with that race. That is, you're going to have to have your poles and your skis and your race suit, and the th same thing is true of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is going to need to be assembled right there. It needs to have special factors that allow it to recognize the promoter, and it's got some things called trans transcription factors that associate with it. So it's like everything comes together right there at the promoter or the start line for the process of transcription. So an initiation site at which transcription complexes, the transcription complex assembles. And what's interesting is that in bacteria, there may be a, a single promoter that controls many, many genes. So we may see more than one gene controlled by a single promoter. And I'm actually going to make a drawing of this. Like today is totally drawing day. And we're going to see in some bacteria, some archaea, we might see a situation where we don't just have one gene, but instead we have many genes that are all controlled by the same start line. And this is actually going to matter. So if this is our promoter, I'm going to put P for promoter. We might have, you know, maybe five genes that are all controlled, and I'm just going to number them. One, two, three four, five, wow, this is a lot of genes, all controlled by that same promoter. So what that means is that when RNA polymerase binds at that promoter and it begins reading the genes and it reads the template strand, well, then that means that it's going to make an RNA that has the information for all five genes on it. So let's say time lapse uh, time has passed here, and now we get the synthesis of an RNA, and that RNA, of course, looks like the temp or looks like the coding strand, only use replace T's. So we're going to get the RNA, but on that RNA, we're going to have information for gene one, information for gene two, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So information for gene one, information for gene two, information for gene three four, and five, all on the same RNA. That RNA, of course, looking like the coding strand. So this is cool because what this means is what is made is what's called a, a many, many poly cistronic mRNA. So when we see more than one gene under control of the same promoter, we actually call it, so this is called an operon. We call it an operon. And the mRNA that's made is called polycystronic. The information for many genes is kept on that RNA. So anytime you see something that looks like this, where there's more than one gene controlled by the same promoter, you can quickly say to yourself, ba -bum, that's an operon, right? Um, so we recognize that as being lingo. Now, if we see an mRNA that has the information for multiple genes, we can quickly say, aha, uh -huh, that's a polycystronic mRNA. Now, in eukaryotes, generally every single gene has its own promoter. Um, so generally every gene has its own promoter. 
mRNAs carry the information for only one gene, and as you guessed it, they are not polycystronic, they are monocystronic. Once again, a little more boring than our bacteria and archaea. So as we mentioned, the promoter is not literally a blue box. And in fact, it is a unique sequence of nucleotides. And I want to investigate now at this point what that unique sequence is. So hopefully everybody's got this drawing down. If not, pause me and get your drawing done and get your thoughts collected. Um, and I want to go ahead and talk about what these promoter sequences are. So every promoter um, is defined by a consensus sequence. That is, if we take all kinds of different promoters and we compare them, we can find out what nucleotide happens in each position the most frequently. And that allows us to identify what we would call an ideal consensus sequence. That ideal consensus sequence includes two areas. There's a region 35 nucleotides to the left of the, the start site. That is, if you remember, if you start the plus one is the start site, minus one, and then you count all the way to minus 35, you're gonna hit the first consensus sequence. So of course that's in this region that we're showing as the blue box. That first minus 35 sequence is very surprisingly called the minus 35 sequence. Um, and it is always ideally TT GACA. TT GACA is the ideal consensus sequence. That doesn't mean that promoters always have exactly TT GACA. It just means that they're the strongest or they're the most frequently transcribed when they do have that ideal sequence of TT GACA. But of course, the minus 10 region also contributes to this. So a little closer to the start site is the minus 10, or the Tata box. The Tata box is by far the most famous of promoters because not only do bacteria and archaea have a minus 10 Tata box, but we also see a Tata box in eukaryotes. It's, it's in a different place, but it still is an, a Tata consensus sequence. So if, um, if a bacterium has a TTGACA Tata at sequence that is very, very similar to this sequence, then we say that it is a strong promoter and it's transcribed really, really frequently. That is, it closely resembles this ideal and it makes it very frequent to be transcribed. If it's actually really a poor match, like maybe it's T A C A C A, then it's much weaker. That is, there are less of these nucleotides that match the ideal sequence. And we would say that the promoter is weak and it's transcribed infrequently. Now, the question does pre present itself as to whether it's always good to have a strong promoter. A strong promoter means frequent transcription, but not all genes, it's not beneficial for all genes to be transcribed super, super frequently, right? Because some gene products aren't needed in high concentrations. So one way to regulate the expression of genes is to change what that consensus sequence is. And then cells actually use that to their advantage. It allows them to determine the level to which those gene products are expressed, right? Maybe sometimes it's beneficial to have only a trickle of expression, whereas sometimes it's, you know, for certain gene products, you want a downpour. Um, and some of those would be things, gene products that are associated in day-to-day -day housekeeping functions. Those are going to have very strong promoters, whereas those that are needed less frequently are going to have very, very weak promoters. So it really does depend on what the gene product does within the cell. Let's practice and see if we can pick out the, the promoter that is the strongest. That is to say, the one that has a, the sequence that is most similar to ideal. So starting with the top one there, let's see if we can highlight the differences. So T-T-A-G-A-C-A, there's the first difference. That would be a G, G-A-C-A. -A. Okay, so there's only one difference there. T-A-T-A-A, -A -A, two differences there. Okay, so T, T, oh boy, two differences already, Gaka. T A T A A. Wow, that one's a weak promoter, right? T T Gaga. Okay, there's only one difference. Ta ta. -a. Oh, there we go. There's our strongest promoter. There are only two differences right there from ideal. So T T Gaga. 
Pada at. That is our strongest of the three promoters. Since we're so on fire right now, and I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm totes feeling jazz. So let's go ahead and go on and talk about another example where we can apply this same concept. Not only do we get to apply the concept here, but we also get to review. So you get to put flex your mind on, on the whole replication process that we already covered. So all of the following accurately describe either prokaryotic replication or transcription except. So notice that we're looking for the false statement. During replication, Okazaki fragments are formed during the synthesis of the lagging strand, but not during the synthesis of the leading strand. Absolutely, right? That's the whole Okazaki fragment thing. That's what that's all about. It's only done when their lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. The next deoxynucleoside triphosphate that DNA polymerase would add to the currently synthesizing strand would be DCTP. Okay, well, remember DNA polymerase is wicked fast, wicked accurate, but it, it's very needy, right? It needs a lot of things. And one of the things that it needs is an open 3' hydroxyl. So look at here, we have one open 3' hydroxyl here and one here, okay? But the other thing that DNA polymerase needs is a template, right? It needs building blocks and a template. So if we assume building blocks are present, in only in one case do we see actually a template. Notice that right here, if cytosine tried to pair with something, there wouldn't, there isn't a, a, a template to be had here, right? There isn't another strand to guide what would be added at this 3' hydroxyl. How would the polymerase enzyme know what would go next? Because there isn't anything there isn't any template here. However, if we look at this 3' hydroxyl, notice that guanine loves to pair with cytosine. So it would pair with a C right there, and the next nucleotide that would be added right here would be DCTP. So let's see how that sounds. Yes, good. Okay, bing. That one is checked off the list. True, because we're looking for the false statement, right? So true, true. And then down here, um, a promoter with a minus 35 sequence of T, G, C, A, G, A. Oh boy, okay. T, T, G, A, G, A. Oh man, that's not very strong, is it? And a minus 10 of T, T, A, A. There's our differences. Is stronger than a promoter with minus 35 of T, T, G, A, A. Oh, one difference. And how to, oh no, that is a false statement because clearly the first promoter is weaker than the second promoter. So we've got our answer, but let's see why D is true. The coding strand of DNA has the same sequence as the RNA transcript, only use replace Ts. Bingo! The concept I said I would cover at least 10 times today. So right there we've hit time number two, and I promise you at least eight more times. <laughs>